Today's topic is rotational motion, and in particular, we are going to be talking about rotational motion about a fixed axis. So lots of things in life will rotate about a fixed axis, important things. Uh, you can think of the earth, you can think of wheels, um, and uh, as always, that's what you should be doing. Take the concepts uh, that you're given and try to think of different ways they could be applied. So we're going to, with rotational motion, uh, develop for rotational motion a lot of the concepts that we've already developed. So things such as speed and acceleration and displacement uh, are all going to come now into rotational motion. And uh, let's get started. Okay, so we will talk about an angular displacement with rotational motion rather than a physical linear displacement, and the term for that will be theta here. And we will also take a look at angular velocity, and there's the symbol for that, and angular acceleration, which, which is uh, alpha here. So terms that we're familiar with with linear motion, we're now going to be uh, applying to rotational motion. So those are the symbols to get us started. All right, an important part of this here is the idea of radians. So uh, we often talk about putting our calculators in degree mode, <laughs> and now we're going to be talking about radians here. So the idea of radians is we're going to define, as we go through an angle here, uh, right with our angular motion, rotational motion, uh, as we go through the angle theta, we could talk about the radius of the motion. That'll be this here. And we could also talk about the arc link, S. And in a way, S is going to be like the displacement that we've talked about before, uh, meaning that if we stretched it out, it's kind of like the linear displacement that we'd be talking about. But this is a little different because it's rotational and it is on a curve. So just as a point of reference, and you're probably familiar with this already, one radian is 57.3 degrees. Okay, so there's the... Uh, set up here for uh, talking about it, um, and this probably makes some sense to you already, and here's how you can make your conversions from degrees to radians, or um, uh, radians to degrees. Okay, and that should make a little bit of sense there too. Right, 360 degrees, 2 pi r, uh, that should make some sense to you. Okay, so uh, we're talking about here with the angular displacement, the angle that we move through, and I think we've already pretty much described that there, and this is uh, talking about the angular position. And again, in degrees, it would be 360 degrees going all the way around. All right, so just as we talk about displacement, now we'll talk about angular displacement. Okay. And we're also talking about things here that are uh, solid, and we're going to be talking about the uh, axis and um, that there is no movement of the body itself. So we're talking about solid objects that are rotating about a fixed axis. And that's the important part about this. So um, all of these things are going to go through the same angle at the same time. There's not a little, there's no fluidity in it. And there we go. Okay, so, um, and this sort of makes some sense here, too. You could talk about where you ended up minus where you started, and that would be your angular displacement. And the other thing that's uh, worth pointing out here is that every point along here will go through the angular displacement. But I think you can see already that the arc lengths would be different depending on the radius. So we're going to use that to relate the idea of the linear to the rotational. Okay, so now how about angular speed then? Just as we had displacement over time is linear velocity, we'll talk about angular displacement over time as being angular velocity. So there is uh, angular velocity, and there's the symbol for angular velocity that I'm circling there. And that should make some sense to you too. Like I said, again, we're going to be applying all of the linear concepts that we've developed into rotational motion. And we've already begun. Okay, so when we're talking about scientific units here, if we're uh, dealing with newtons and joules and such like that, we're uh, going to have to be in radians per second. So uh, we'll remember that part of it. And let's see, my screen seems to be jumping around on me a little bit here. 
Okay, so let's see here. We're talking about speed as being positive if we're going counterclockwise and negative if we are going clockwise. I always thought that was a little counterintuitive, but uh, that's the convention, and we're going to go along with it. We won't buck the system there. Um, but again, this negative and positive stuff is arbitrary, as we've discussed before, but that is the convention, so it's worth discussing. Okay. Um, and uh, acceleration. This is another thing that we've talked about with linear motion, and now we can talk about it with rotational motion. So alpha is the symbol for rotational acceleration or angular acceleration, and as you would imagine, it's the change in angular speed over time. And we'll use this to develop uh, uh, equations that are very similar to the kinematic equations for linear motion. Okay, so again, uh, radians over seconds squared, that's going to be uh, dealing in seconds is going to give us an SI unit, and uh, here we've talked about it again. Positive uh, accelerations are counterclockwise, and negative accelerations are in the clockwise direction. Okay. All right, and, and this, this uh, line here is, is uh, really bringing up what I said before with um, the idea of angular displacement here. Uh, every one of the points here along the uh, rotating object are going to have the same angular speed and acceleration, but tangentially it'll be different, and that'll depend on the radius, how far they are. And that comes back to the idea of the different arc lengths as well. Okay, so as promised here, here are the equations that we've dealt with for you know, kinematic motion, linear motion here, and here are the equivalents uh, for rotational motion. And that should make some good sense uh, as well. And here I have blown them up a little bit bigger so you can see them uh, a little bit better maybe. Uh, but again, these are very equivalent. So once you get used to it, it's going to be very similar calculations to what you've done before. So you should be on some comfortable ground here with this new topic. Okay, and uh, here are the ways that we are going to relate the two things, the linear and the rotational. And again, it has something to do with the radius, where they are on the object. So uh, the displacements here, what we've been calling D, uh, now they're calling it S because in particular it's that arc length. So it's not exactly linear, it's on a curve. But if you took that piece of curve and stretched it out, certainly that would be uh, analogous, analogous to the linear motion. So this is how we can convert back from one to the other. And uh, these things don't show up on the formula sheet for the uh, AP exam. So these are good ones for you to start you know, getting in your memory here because you'll have to use them without having them available to you on the formula sheet. Okay, so again, just uh, this uh, whole blurb here is bringing up the idea that the angular motion are the same any point along the way, but it just depends on the radius here. And I've brought that up a couple of different times, but here you have that information again. Right. So uh, lots of this stuff here, right? If we have some kind of analogies to what we've been doing before, we can now talk about centripetal acceleration and relate our centripetal acceleration to our angular quantities as well. So here's the conversion over there. And this is, again, one that just doesn't show up on the AP formula sheet, so it's something for you to be uh, comfortable and familiar with. Okay, and uh, this makes a little bit of sense, I guess. The centripetal acceleration is going to go toward the center. The tangential acceleration is at a 90-degree angle to it. So basically, we form a right triangle with our accelerations, and the overall acceleration uh, can be found using the Pythagorean theorem here, uh, with the sides of the tangential side and the centripetal side. And that should make some sense too, and hopefully that's comfortable for you. Like always, if these things don't make sense, then uh, bring them up in class. I'm sure there'll be some questions on this. It's a lot to take in uh, here with the rotational motion, because basically, again, we're taking all of the concepts that we've developed and throwing them all at you at once here with rotational motion. Um, and hopefully that makes a little sense to you. Okay, so uh, they are vectors here, these angular quantities are. So this is the uh, right hand rule, and the idea is if you uh, grab it with your right hand, you can see by the diagram there, and uh, what you're doing there is you are having your fingers point in the way of the direction. So this is, again, uh, just the convention for talking about which way we're talking 
um, about the motion here. Again, it's a little bit arbitrary, um, but that's, uh, uh, this is the convention and this is what we'll go by here. Okay. And uh, all right, so again, they talk about the, uh, the uh, angular velocity is going out of the page or into the page here. Uh, not something to worry about too much here, but the idea of one direction or the other direction is pretty important, the idea of opposite directions. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about that, especially when velocities and accelerations are in different directions or in the same direction. That will change the, way the uh, outcome of the problems. Okay, so, yeah, and this is what I was just talking about here. So if they are in the same direction, they're going to be increasing the speed. And if the acceleration and the velocities are in opposite directions, uh, then the angular speed is going to be slowing down. So that's pretty familiar to us uh, from uh, what we've talked about before with linear motion. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the idea of torque here. Uh, and uh, this is going to be the causes of the rotational motion. And you could probably think about this. Forces are going to be involved in causing some kind of motion here, uh, but um, you know it de really depends on where you're placing your force here as far as what kind of rotational motion you're going to be getting. And a good thing to test out here is a door. If you look at a door, and uh, you, you know you could talk about it as being in a hinge. Well, you know your door probably doesn't go in a circle, uh, or most doors don't. Some do, right? But uh, what's the idea there? If you are close to where the rotation is, close to where the hinge is, you don't have a big radius there. And it takes a lot more force to get the door moving. But if you're farther away, you get a little bit more use out of that force if you're farther uh, away from the point of rotation. Um, and that's the idea of the radius there. So torque is going to have something to do with the force that you supply, but also the radius of the motion. And we'll develop torque here in the next couple of slides as well. But that's the general idea of torque for you. Okay, so you could uh, talk about torque as being the radius multiplied by the force. But as you can see in that last slide, and I'm going to now jump back to it, it's really the force, uh, the part of the force or the component of the force that is perpendicular uh, to the object that's being rotating. That's what's causing the motion here. If the force is uh, not at all, if there's no perpendicular force at all, you're not going to get any rotation here. And depending on your angle, uh, you're going to, if you're applying the force at an angle, it's the component here. Uh, that is causing the rotation. So now I'm going to jump back to the slide I was on and this is the way that they are presenting it on the formula sheet. Tau here is the symbol for torque and here they're indicating that it is the perpendicular, the radius perpendicular to the force and the way we'll make that perpendicular is by taking that force and multiplying it by the sine and on the previous slide I, I think you get a good idea of why that's true. Okay, so uh, R is uh, the radius of it, F is the force, and theta is the angle between the force and the position of where you're placing that force. Okay, and like we've done, this is now going to be sort of like Newton's laws, uh, right, or Newton's second law here. It's the sum of the uh, torques that are going to be affecting the motion here. So you have to talk about whether they're uh, working at odds with each other. If they're working in the same direction, then uh, you're going to add them together. And if they're working in opposite directions, of course, you are going to subtract them. And once again, the counterclockwise is considered positive and the clockwise is considered negative. A um, little counterintuitive for me when, they, uh, when, they first, uh, when I first saw that. Uh, but we'll get used to all of that kind of stuff. And again, this negative and positive stuff is arbitrary. Uh, but uh, we'll go with that convention anyway. Okay, so what are we talking about? And I had mentioned Newton's second law here. Um, you know, so um, when you add up the net torques here, um, it's kind of like talking about the net force. So you are very well aware that Newton's second law is the sum of the forces is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration. There's Newton's second law. And in uh, for angular motion here, we would be talking about the sum of the torques. And this here I is what's called the moment of inertia. 
Uh, and the idea of the moment of inertia, it's kind of like mass would be. It's not mass, but it's the moment of inertia for a rotating object. And we're going to talk more about that uh, as we develop angular motion, because we have a little bit more to go on that. But for now, let's just take that uh, at face value. The moment of inertia is sort of analog analogous to the mass in Newton's second law. Uh, but once again, it's the uh, acceleration is going to be proportional to the uh, net torque, just as uh, the linear acceleration is proportional to the net force. So there is the formula that I think kind of looks like Newton's second law. On the formula sheet, they jumble it around a little bit, and uh, they make it look like this, though. So this should be clear to you as well. Um, but that's, uh, again, the way they present it on the formula sheet, so I want you to be familiar with that. Um, but again, it's just really manipulating the variables here. Okay, so, um, yeah, the um, moment of inertia, and this is a little bit more about that, uh, the mass is just the amount of matter, but the moment of inertia is about how that is distributed. And that has something to do with the center of mass calculations that we did a little bit earlier on. But again, for right now, we don't have too much uh, to worry about other than the idea of the moment of inertia. We're not going to be doing any calculations at the moment. But again, it has something to do with the center of mass that we had talked about a little bit earlier. Now, <laughs> that's a lot to take in. And uh, so if you watch the video, and I hope you took some good notes on it, then you've got something to go on, but you probably have some questions. So bring some of those questions with you to class, and uh, we'll start working on some problems, too, uh, that involve these quantities, and we'll get a little bit more comfortable with it. So see you back in class, and thank you for watching. Thank you.